here we are again from the hymns floor. We have Anish Chopra here. Anish, always a pleasure. Bill, thank you. I see you're uh, partaking from the uh, various booths that are out That's here. That's right. It's it, the benefit of hymns. It is amazing. So, uh, hey, great keynote. That thank was you. Uh, that was phenomenal. Thank you. Um, three administrations. Yeah. Democrat, Republican. Um, what, multiple decades. It is. It's it's unbelievable how long, and, and we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah. So a lot of big things happening in interoperability. That's right. Why don't you give us a rundown of just some of the things you guys talked about yeah. on uh, at, on the keynote and, and go from so there. So there are really three things at Captain that I think are going to make, I, I don't want to say that this is the year that we see material progress because it may feel a little bit like, well, everyone says that. Right. I genuinely believe it. Three things we spoke of. One, the new default in interoperability is that the patient and the apps that they choose will be the destination for health information so in a standardized patient format. Patient-centric interoperability. That's right. That, that, that was the default, and that came through not just in spiritual language, like aspirationally we should do this, it even came out of economics. Uh, the rules now say any consumer app uh, with the uh, consumer's uh, opt-in will have free access to the data, no fees, no burden, no special effort. So that was point number one consumer at the center. Point number two, and this is interesting, the decades we've been at this have been about EHRs, right. doctors, hospitals. We've now introduced regulation on the health plans. Right. That's a pretty bold statement. And now we're going to have standardized claims data to combine with standardized clinical data. And I think it creates the momentum that basically says we're going to be unfettered in uh, moving all of healthcare data towards a common language that's available to consumers via open APIs. And that will cover social determinants of health, it'll cover prescription data, pricing data, quality data, a whole range of topics. That's point two. And then last but not least, and this is the interesting one, and I'm gonna float this idea with you, Bill, and you're gonna react one way or the other. I think we're entering into a net neutrality era for healthcare data business models. And so what that means is uh, the, the rules, information blocking rules allow that if you're holding data, and you have to invest in API technology in order to release the data, you can recoup those costs by charging fees to the applications that wish to connect. Not the consumer's fees uh, apps, but the uh, uh, physician's apps and other apps. But those fees have to be tied to the marginal cost of the program. And that also means that you're allowed to provide value-added services, but they have to be non-discriminatory and they are likely to be competitive. So you can't have the fact that you're in possession of the data to be the sole source of said value-added service, a prediction model, a service here, there, or the other, but rather others should be able to compete to deliver that last mile, the doctors, the insurance companies, to anybody else. That's a powerful concept because it puts in place a nice rule of the road for what's been a gray area about economics as we move to an API-based uh, uh, interoperability marketplace. All right, so I'm going to... Some of what you say is policy speak. Yes, it is. So the first two is very easy. The third, the third one, complicated. All right. So again, we're going to be talking to IT organizations predominantly on this podcast. Yep. So um, let's assume I have an innovation arm. We're yes. going to develop an application. The application is uh, I'm going to use Blue Button 2.0. I'm going to get that data. I'm going to get the data from the health plan. I'm going yep. to get the data from the health system. That's right. And I'm now going to have a consumer-based application. Yes. That they put all that data in there, and it's going to identify where they can go for durable goods, where they can go for awesome. You know, it's it's almost like a uh, like an Uber for care navigation. That's right. All right. So we just dreamt that up. They get the easy pass where they can connect to all those source systems at no marginal cost. Right. But who who do I have to pay? So one nobody. Of the, nobody. Nobody on the consumer so side. So you talked about an incremental cost and an incremental value, and I, the, I I heard cost. Yeah. So here we go. So if you're the supplier of the data, if you're the health system, and you've just made this investment to upgrade to stage three meaningful use, what we used to call meaningful use, promoting interoperability, and you have this uh, API gateway where consumers can connect apps, you've got to find a way to incorporate that cost into your delivery model. Right. However, if an application developer wants to connect to an, insur an insurance company, wants to grab information on behalf of the whole population, or maybe uh, a value-added service that wants to sell into the organization that wants to maybe offer a prediction model or some other value-added service. Those applications may pay either the hospital or the EHR vendor a reasonable fee to access the data to perform their service. Right. That is what's regulated. I call that net neutrality because there is a cost of running multiple applications in the enterprise, 
And if it's tapping into the database that's been built uh, for uh, meaningful use or for the consumer use case, that extra cost of managing it will have to be recouped somewhere. No one's going to just say this is all un unfettered access. Now, the question is, can I charge one price for Bill, because you're my buddy, and another price to Susie, who's a competitor and may do things that I don't really believe should be done, or is it gonna undercut me for my service? I, I cannot discriminate on the fees that we charge to recoup the costs, and nor can I discriminate on what the value added services. I have to be able to compete in an open marketplace. So even if I'm not in the innovation arm of Fed Health System. Correct. I can just develop, we, you and I can go off Correct. develop this app and then go, yep. hey, we're tapping into your data. That's right. And the beauty of it is there's no BAAs, no business association agreements, no data use agreements. Right, because it's going to the individual. The consumer has the right to pull the data out of a HIPAA covered entity or a hospital or a doctor's office and move it to an application that they trust to use in whatever manner they wish. What about between me, so I'm, I'm developing it, yeah. and the health system? It's, doesn't the health system? Nope. They're not required to make sure that I'm going to protect the data. So if, I'm no. responsible for making sure I protect the data? And in fact, you're onto an important subject, which is how are we going to regulate all of these applications that Bill's making in a garage or Susie's making in a startup in Silicon Valley? And the answer is right now they're unregulated apps. But we are working through the Karen Alliance that I have the opportunity to serve as co-chair of to work with other stakeholders in the industry on making sure we have a code of conduct so that these applications behave in a certain manner and that they communicate to patients are going to behave in a certain manner. And if they lie or mislead their customer, they're going to be regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. So will there be a certification process for these? We have to see that happen. We're waiting to see what the right model is. One short-term example would be we announced a collaboration with uh, uh, smartplatforms.org uh, or the Ken yeah. Mandel and Zach Hayden uh, team at Harvard where they already have an app gallery, the Smart App Gallery, yep. there might be a badge that says I endorsed the code of conduct, and that may be a way of communicating that they're going to honor this, and if they lie, then that could be the basis of So a you kept talking suit. about a Roku box. I did. Is that like just a fire server? Is that essentially what you're yes, talking about? Yes, what I'm describing here is that uh, there will be a set-top box at every doctor's office in every hospital, and the person that logs into that set-top box is a consumer with an app in her hands. And so now the question is today, what channels can she subscribe to? Right. And I was jokingly referring that the common clinical data set, I referenced it to be the PBS without doubt and Abbey. Right. And the comment there was that it's okay and it's useful, but if you're trying to understand the clinical progression of my cancer, right. you might want to have access to the underlying notes. We and need maybe a, lot a, more bunch a lot more clinical data. Right. So now the question is, how quickly can we add channels to said Roku box? Yeah. And I believe we will be adding channels at the pace of industry consensus. They may be outside of the EHR consensus process. It may be the cloud vendors agreeing to things. It may be uh, specialty areas like imaging and others. But the pace of consensus is what will drive the pr provision of those uh, uh, standards-based open channels. So I'm going to bring you back. Yeah. Because again, Roku box. So I'm, I'm talking. We're talking to a lot of people who are going to have to implement this. Yes, they and are. We say, okay, it's a fire server. Yes, it is. But uh, when you describe a Roku box, it sounds like, oh, it's Apple TV. You just plug it in. All of a sudden, it's pulling the data from all scripts yes. and making it available. Yes. But they probably have some work to do. It's not. Well, you're on to an important subject, and this is where the question between. EHR vendors and third-party Roku's come into play. That's why I refer to it not as Apple TV or Amazon Prime, which are tethered to things that are you know fully integrated packages, but Roku, which is an open platform. The issue for me right now is uh, every hospital that goes live on the 2015 edition of their certified EHR, they are going to get combined the heavy lifting that their vendor had done to convert whatever the proprietary data model was inside their organization into the fire data model, which is open, and then through a gateway to connect to apps that register and are securely managed. Now, you can have your EHR vendor own that entire stack from the set-top box all the way to the converting of the data to create yeah. the channel. And a lot of CIO as well. I think that's the default. But there should be enough competitive pressure that if that does not behave the way they wish, or if they would like to move faster, or they would like to have some other role to play, that there may be an opportunity to substitute, kind of jailbreak your uh, Roku, so that you could have your own version 
that sits uh, on top of what all that heavy work was done. So if I've converted the data to the fire data model, that's the heavy lifting that you're getting from the EHR vendor. Now, how you manage access to it, that's API management. Now, am I not going to get ahead of the, the standard if I do that? You are on to something really important. Here's the gap. Today, right now, there is a draft specification, it's essentially final, for a fire-based scheduling resource. Right, but you're going to do this in all these areas. Well, let's start with scheduling. Okay. It's live. How many hospitals are in production on the fire-based scheduling module? It's, that was published a year ago. I wouldn't imagine that many. Well, now, how many hospitals pay a third-party vendor X hundred dollars a month to allow online scheduling on top of their systems? The majority. And how many of those CIOs knew that they could have asked their vendor for the fire scheduling option, right. potentially lowering the cost of integration? Maybe they did know and they didn't care. Maybe they didn't really see the value and they were happy to pay the price. So this is the conversation. This this is great because this is like the conversation we had over drinks. Yes, it is. It's uh, the, these these CIOs are so busy. You I know, know. They come to this conference and they they hear some somebody from Exponential Medicine talk about AI and they're like, oh crap, there's something else I have to get in front of and I got to do fire and I've got to do I've got to do all so these. So what things. if this wasn't the CIO's job? All right, well, and we're seeing that, right? We're seeing the CIO become a CIO's chief digital officer and chief innovation officer. We're seeing it break out. You hit the nail right on the head. If I'm the CEO of a health system and I say, okay, I have to negotiate a value-based care contract. I got to extend my clinically integrated network. I want to do a better job of engaging my patients. I have all these goals and aspirations for my organization. And they're all on top of technology. And they are built on the assumption that I can move the data to where it's needed to do a job. Yeah. If I'm told by my IT department that you can't, you have to wait, you got to pay extra, I will fail. Right. And so CEOs are asking the question, am I getting the advice that I need to maximize the value of all this infrastructure? And I would argue there's more to be done. Right. And this is a great conversation. So, right, so, go, so Governor Levitt, last thing. Yes, sir. Call to action. Yes. Uh, and I thought it was a great call to action of, all right, policies in place. Yes, it is. The floor is set. Floor is set. Let's raise the roof. But we've set floors before and people didn't go to it. That's so right. what's it going to take for that call to action to really take root? Well, to me, I think there's now a new sense of urgency and new business models, new actors on the stage, and new infrastructure. So the marginal cost of adding a channel on the Roku box will be a heck of a lot lower now than if we tried to add the channel uh, a year, two, three years ago. And that lowering of costs, the emergence of new business models, they're all converging at this time to say, let's move faster. So you're saying the field is set. Yes, it is. Ground is fertile. And with yesterday's rules or the rules that we announced this week, we have a much clear perspective about where we're going. We're not having a debate about is it this format right. or that format. And that's, and that's great. We're going. Because we were we used to be. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Thank you. As always. always. A pleasure. Hey.